Hezbollah. The problem that they have common ground, that is Israel, or common enemy, that is Israel. If they don't have Israel as an enemy, don't be surprised that Hamas and Hezbollah will kill each other. And don't be surprised that Saudi Arabia is threatened by the Iranian uh, uh, government than Israel is threatened by the Iranian government. Um, we can talk about conflicts uh, for, forever in the Middle East. very complicated uh, region, but all I can say that today what's happening, people have access to information, they know more about their identities, they know more about their religions, about their gods, and there is hope in every uh, individual of this new generation to be educated. Uh, also, we need to stimulate their minds to think. Not only education is not the only solution. Education can can uh, bring a solution to problems. It can bring uh, 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 more complicated uh, problems. Education and help them to think in order to understand each other and uh, be able um, to coexist. All of us here represent different uh, minority. Uh, I used to be a majority, now I'm a minority. In the <laughs> and uh, we can talk about, uh, uh, keep talking about this uh, conflict, but we need to get uh, to the level to understand each other, to love each other un unconditionally and forgive each other. Uh, religion is a huge uh, wall, uh, or builds uh, many walls between uh, minorities and majorities and all types of people. And this is the time to understand that religion is not our highest authority as human beings. It's only a tool that we use to make our lives uh, easier. And uh, we hope that we reach a level at some point that we don't talk about Ahmadiyya and uh, other uh, uh, religion being uh, persecuted. And even we don't talk about uh, Sunni and Shia conflict. Because this will affect all types of people. And uh, Teresa will talk about humanity and uh, our uh, future as uh, one, one body. Thank you so much for that question. Hi, um, this is Sidney the Freedom House. And uh, my question is for Amjad. Um, I'm very sorry about the recent violence. We have active programming in Indonesia. Mr. Mubarak was one of our participants. So our staff there were quite. Um, quite upset by um, some of the stuff and in addition to the Ahmadiyya community, even the quote-unquote progressive other Muslim community who's been active in trying to build a um, big dialogue and have a more progressive um, vision of what Islam is, is sort of under attack as, as you well know. Um, one of the challenges we've had is that Indonesia and the U.S. share quite good relations right now. Um, the U.S. is um, has a comprehensive partnership which focuses on a broad range of issues, including human rights, um, which encompasses religious freedom. Um, and, and, and we have people within the Indonesian government who are sympathetic to these issues. However, the Ministry of uh, Religious Affairs uh, is an interesting, uh, interesting ministry. And, and what we are seeing as well is that the, the uh, executive, um, the SBY is trying to balance out all these concerns that they have. So on the, on the one hand, they don't want, you know, they talk the talk, but they say they don't want to just violence, they don't want to condone it. But on the other, it, it really is quite an effort um, for us to get the, them to do the right thing. And it's also an effort for us to get the US, unfortunately, to do the right thing. Um, and we have allies within government, within DRL and the State Department. So that's a challenge for us. What, what advice do you have in terms of us as civil society organizations in the U.S.? How do we help you? Um, we're doing the programming to increase education. We're doing some of the lobbying. We're doing some of the advocacy. But it is challenging because, unfortunately for the U.S., Indonesia is not quite Iran. You know, in a certain way, it's, it's more easy to have international pressure. Um, for the Baha'i community in Iran and for us to convince our U.S. counterparts in government to do that rather than in a quote-unquote democracy. I shouldn't say quote-unquote, it is a democracy with, with issues uh, in Indonesia. Right, good question. So the situation in Indonesia is materially different 
from uh, other countries that the U.S. is engaged with, um, particularly with respect to human rights issues. So the persecution of the Ahmadi community is, uh, should not be viewed in, you know, in isolation. Um, part of the purpose of my testimony today was to offer a view of the persecution as a way for others to connect, uh, connect the dots and draw patterns and inferences of this persecution. You know, in a country like Indonesia, that has a, you know 80% Muslim population, 16% Christian population, and a very tiny Ahmadi community, um, it, it is difficult to uh, necessarily stand on the side of this very tiny minority and, and to, to perhaps interfere in that delicate balance that exists in Indonesia. But it's necessary uh, because extremism and, uh, and Islamic extremism in this country can change that nation to resemble more of, like Pakistan or another nation and if that happens, the world's most populous Muslim country would, and, and purportedly most moderate country, will be nothing of the sort. So the stakes are higher. Now the question is, how do you empower uh, organizations to improve the moderate voices within Indonesia to, to, to fight for this? Well, in, the, the answer I can give is by drawing an analogy. In Bangladesh, the exact same scenario existed. The, the Ahmadi community had been killed in, 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 in large number, and the persecution had continued in 2004. The ban of all Ahmadi publications existed, and the next step for Bangladesh was to institute its own blasphemy law, its own ban of the community. But the U.S. did not let that happen. They intervened using the very secular press that existed, and because it was East Pakistan before, and because it knew of the situation that existed in Pakistan, it did not want to go down that path. And it prevented that from happening. And now the Ahmadi community, while admittedly still persecuted, it is not a government-sponsored regime. That is a very close analogy. Civil societies, the government in Indonesia should be looking at what happened at Bangladesh. And so what is, what is Indonesia going to do? The three ministers who publicly want to see the ban, they know that a, a decree of the kind that exists is a band-aid to a festering sword. They know that the problem of extremism will exist, but how can you reconcile, legally reconcile, Indonesia's religious freedom clause and its constitution with what is happening with the 65 blasphemy law that, by the way, the Constitutional Court of Indonesia has upheld? How can you do that? Where is the country headed? It has ratified the ICCPR, the most important human rights instrument, and yet it will ban a community. It will ban 300,000 people to appease a very small group of religious hardliners. It has to have the courage to act. And the U.S. should, should understand that in spite of the fact that this is not Iran, it is not Pakistan, but nevertheless, it could, Indonesia could metastasize to become the most extreme Muslim country in the world. That can't happen. And we can't let that happen. And that's the purpose of meeting with our leaders and hopefully uh, calmer uh, voices and, and moderate voices prevail. Um, I'm with the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty. We helped submit a brief right. on that issue. Um, can you help me understand, is it a matter of uh, the, the Indian government not being strong enough uh, to stand up against this uh, hardline minority? Or, or is it political? Um, you know, I, what's going on? I think there's a combination of factors. Um, I think that the uh, the Ule, Indonesian Ulema Council, the MUI, when it issued its fatwa in 1980 to um, to uh, declare the Ahmadi community non-Muslim, it had uh, a legal basis to do so because the the 65 blasphemy law only acknowledges six religions and no varying shades, as your brief very uh, astutely points out, no varying shades within these religions. So it's legally only six religions are acknowledged and not the various minority groups that are interspersed within those communities. A group like the Ulema Council can issue a fatwa and say that we are actually upholding the very law that was passed and then when the decree is passed, they are saying, well, the Ahmadi community, by virtue of just convening in a private home, you are quote unquote insulting the Muslim majority, so we will beat these individuals to death and continue to do so. They find, take solace and take comfort in a legal regime that has been entrenched 
and since 1965, and the, the government is, is standing there watching that, and, 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 and they would rather, in the name of public safety and order, have sort of patchwork solution. But until and unless the, the moderates understand that the real source of the problem in Indonesia are the legal instruments that per, embolden the extremists, there will be no change. I do believe, and perhaps it's, it's a bias as a lawyer, but I do believe the real change in Indonesia comes from a legal regime, a legal reform, constitutional reform. And those arguments are much more powerful for a country like Indonesia that has ratified the ICCPR, unlike many other Muslim countries. Yeah. Uh, uh, Terry Teradagi with Kurdish Human Rights Watch. Uh, I'm very concerned about the situation of the Copts in, uh, in Egypt. And I was wondering what the re uh, U.S. refugee program has as far as admissions of persecuted Copts to the U.S. But for you, uh, as far as uh, the Baha'i community is concerned, I'm also very concerned because every day in Iran, uh, Baha'is and Kurds are being hanged because or taken to prison, that infamous prison that you mentioned. Uh, what can we do as an international community, as civil society organizations? And Elizabeth, if you could be so kind to forward to us that uh, 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 SR, uh, the number, so that we can um, you know, send it to our congressional districts and ask. Yeah, of course, if anybody has any questions about the resolution, uh, first, feel free to come out and give me my How can we help in the community? How can civil society organizations, both in the U.S. and, and elsewhere, help? The, the idea of the, the special envoy seems to really be in line with uh, this idea that international pressure is a lot more effective than we might give credit. And it's true there are some countries that you know, we're, we're less inclined to speak out against. But um, you know, really, I can only speak from the Baha'i experience and to say that um, you know, matters could have been a lot worse. We do look around and see other communities that are being persecuted even more. And you know, we stand in solidarity with them, demanding you know, full human rights uh, in all countries, for all people. Uh, but really, um, it seems that if you can garner that kind of uh, public attention worldwide, these, these regimes are concerned with um, you know, the U.S. influencing Europe, for example. Some of those countries, um, they might curry more favor with them, and they're worried about the U.S. influencing that. Thanks for your question. Um, I, I do agree that international pressure um, is oftentimes underestimated. The idea of the special envoy is a critical one. In the case of Egypt, Egypt is currently rebuilding the entire country, including all its legal frameworks, including its constitution. Um, this is the time, this is a great opportunity, not to dictate um, what Egypt's laws should be, but simply to provide technical assistance and also to urge those in charge to heed the calls of the Egyptian people. The Egyptian people over the course of 18 days, um, their revolution never devolved into a demand for an Islamic state. Um, it was always for freedom and democracy. Muslims and Christians, old and young, uh, men and women, were out there on the streets um, calling for those quote-unquote secular demands. Um, so that's one thing. On the issue of, of the US granting asylum to Christians, um, I understand that they do um, and the, you know, given that they understand the plight of Christians in the Middle East. However, to me, um, that's not, that's, that's an alleviating measure. It's certainly not the solution. Um, Copts predate Muslims in Egypt. They are pre-Arab uh, in ethnicity. Um, their, home, uh, their home is in that part of the world. Um, there is no reason why we should simply accept the status quo or accept the fact that they should be extinct or forced out of their indigenous lands. Um, they need to stake a claim in their country's futures and they need to have the support of the international community and the recognition of their plight. Um, the Copts are simply one of the most tragic cases because uh, their plight is simply not, um, not propagated, not heard of. Um, and so please, you know, do everything that you can. I'm happy to, you know, uh, sit around and, and talk to whoever um, and provide whatever information there is. But I believe that the solution is for Egyptians, all Egyptians to be integrated under a new, new human rights framework that recognizes and extends equality to all. So I think what we should do now is maybe collect three more questions since we're already running um, a little over time. So 
three more questions or so, and then have people um, answer, and then we can sure. adjourn. Um, Jeremy, uh, you, ma'am, and then the gentleman back there. So Jeremy first, and then Rickerita. Jeremy with the International Christian Concern. My question is primarily for Masaf. Anyone else wants to jump in? What's your take on current upheaval in the Middle East, North Africa? Where is it going? And what kind of effect will it have on minorities of the area? Um, the Christian minorities? Go ahead. Um, I want to ask Mr. Uh, in Middle East, starting from Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia and other Arab countries, there is a strong movement about modernization of Islam and separate state from the mosque. Are you, do you have any connection with these groups and how affected uh, the international Islamic world uh, with that? Second, I want to ask what is the percentage of young generation in, including of the, these 10 million people that you mentioned, and what's the percentage of women? Please. Thank you. Sir? My question was to Dina. Um, in, in Egypt, what is the what is your relationship with other minority groups, uh, for instance, the Baha'is, and in particular the Amdiya group? Uh, because we have, as you as, as I just mentioned, we have faced uh, recent persecution. Uh, is there a relationship with these groups um, uh, in Egypt? Okay, we well, need to go. Um Right, so Masaf, you want to go first, and I'll just uh, answer it on the line. What's happening in the Middle East? <laughs> 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 in two sentences. <laughs> right. I, I agree with Dina, first of all, that this is not an Islamic revolution that's happening in Egypt. Uh, Islamists are trying to hijack it. But at the same time, I believe that this is the beginning of collapse of the political Islam in the Middle East. The entire political Islamic systems are collapsing. And uh, next is going to be the collapse of the entire belief system. This is the beginning of collapse of the grip of religion over uh, for them, more than um, 1,400 years that had authority uh, over people and kept them captive uh, in uh, its uh, grip. This is the time that people are looking for freedom. This is the time that minorities won't suffer from majority, not because majority was persecuting uh, minority, because the main religion of the Middle East, Islam, has been persecuted, first of all Muslims, I believe. Since I am an ex-Muslim, I know that Islam does not have lots of mercy on Muslims and it sends them to death. And uh, I disagree that the real nature of Islam is a peaceful nature. And I can see this clearly in the behavior of Muhammad, the Prophet of Islam himself. Uh, Ahmadiyya and its leader, maybe it's a peaceful denomination. I agree with that. Peaceful people. The majority of Muslims are peaceful people. But the religion itself never been peaceful religion. And today, for the first time in 1400 years, people say no to religion. They're looking for freedom. They're looking for uh, liberty. This is what they have been missing. Yes, they're angry. Maybe they don't have directions where to go, but I believe that Islam and religion in general cannot stand information. People have access to information. Today they understand their leaders. The idea, for example, the idea of who Muhammad is, that Muslims have the modern Muhammad, is totally different than the Muhammad who lived 1400 years ago. Different than the Muhammad that is in the books of Muslims and in the Quran. Today, any Muslim simply can Google any type of information. The walls of isolation that the Islamic religious system built to protect Islam for 1400 years are gone since 
the invention of internet. And what we see in the Middle East is not a scary thing, it is a very dangerous transition, I believe, and we pray. Also, we need to work very hard to build bridges of understanding with everybody, but at the same time, instead of freaking out that Muslims of Brotherhood are going to take over, I don't believe that they're going to take over, even if they are in charge, I'm not threatened by the Muslim Brotherhood, because I know that humanity will heal and the new generation of the Middle East will be able to get out of this captivity of religion and radicalism and all bad ideologies. Thank you very much. So to the question of uh, connecting with modernizers within the Middle East, um, so good question. There are uh, individual groups, as we've seen in the Middle East, who have an impulse and democratic movement to see change. The question is, do these modernizers believe in the core understanding of a separation of mosque and state as a theological point? And, and, and if they do obtain power, will they truly see uh, a change where, for example, punishment for apostasy is not death, as it exists in other Muslim regimes? Even, even where there, are, if there is democratic movement, we view that with um, perhaps cautious optimism. We would like to collaborate with those who would like to uh, institute absolute justice in these regimes. And uh, we, we have a thriving missions in the Middle East. We have a thriving mission in Haifa. We have a thriving mission in Palestine, in Palestinian territories, in Egypt, and throughout the Middle East as well. Um, but we, we, would, we, we also are very aware that there are fatwas against our community declaring us to be non-Muslim that exist in Egypt, that exist in, by, by Al-Azhar University and other main institutions, even by those who are democratic against us. So we, 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 we understand that and we hope and pray that the situation there will truly improve where when the legal regime is set up, when the constitution is, is, is designed, it will have the true freedoms that are necessary for all Muslim communities and all people. On the issue of percentage of women in our community, it's quite large. Um, I, don't, I can't put a figure on it, but there are many, many, many millions of women in our community. And they occupy many different roles within our community throughout 190 uh, countries. And we do believe very strongly that our women are empowered and we do believe in women's issues and empowerment. That's one of the hallmarks of our community. Um, Bruce, yeah, just on Mossad's point, even though the, a lot of the revolutions that are unfolding across the region are not um, Islamic, um, never uh, uh, believe for a second that the forces of political Islam will go quietly into the night. Um, that's not their mission. Uh, they want to exercise pockets of influence in various ways. Um, we need to be vigilant, not because these people are inherently evil or because they should be inherently rejected, but simply because they don't reflect accurately the desires of the vast majority of the peoples in the region. That's what we should be striving for. So that in, 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 in moving forward, we should be seeking to protect the principles of these revolutions. The principles of these revolutions so far are being expressed in the form of a desire for civil democratic states that respect human rights. So that's number one. Um, does political Islam have a place? Um, it may. We shouldn't overstate that place. We shouldn't also underestimate or systematically exclude anyone who proves their democratic credentials, who proves uh, that they are willing to play by the rules of the democratic game. In the case of the Muslim Brotherhood, they are seeking to establish a political party now, but they continue, for example, to say that no Christian and no woman could ever lead their political party or ever lead the country. That, to me, does not spell a commitment to democracy, to full democracy, and that's the problem. Um, in terms of your question, yes, thank you very much for it. Um, in some ways, oh, are you being... No, no, the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood. <laughs> it's more romantic than the last one, actually. Um, in, in terms of the, 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 the Christian population of Egypt, in some ways, they have it better than the Ahmadis and the Qur'anis and the non-conformist Sunnis um, and the Pa'is in Egypt because after all Christianity is recognized as being a heavenly religion, one of the three 
um, that has legal recognition from the state. Now, in practice, it's very different. Baha'is, for example, are not even allowed to build houses of worship, period. Legally so. Christians technically have that right, however, in practice, it's severely restricted. Um, the, 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 their situation is particularly vulnerable, not only because uh, um, the state discriminates, but because of this dangerous sort of inciting game that the state plays along with an azhar in inciting the vast majority of the population against these populations to say that they're heretics. Um, the Baha'is, for example, uh, uh, had their homes targeted and burned a couple of years ago because a member of the ruling party went on television to declare the Baha'is as heathens and heretics. Um, many, many, many legislations that have been undertaken by the ruling party um, against non-conformist Sunnis, and there have been case after case of Sunni bloggers that simply express views that oppose that of the al Ashar establishment and were thrown in prison and were left to languish in prison. Um, and sometimes those are, those are the cases that you really don't hear of because for, for the reason that my colleague here articulated is that these are Muslims. And when we look at the plights of minorities in the Middle East, we look at Christians, we look at Jews, we look at all non-Muslims, but not necessarily Muslims. Um, uh, you know, Baha'is probably, and, and Shiites in Egypt uh, probably have it the worst in terms of legal recognition. They only compete with, or Christians only compete with them um, when a Muslim has converted to Christianity and then has to deal with uh, uh, the whole debacle of having that identified on their national ID card. Egypt is one of the few countries in the world that still requires you to identify your religion on your national ID card. So of course, because apostasy is illegal in Islam, converting, yeah, I mean, Iraq and in other places too. Um, so, of course, when a Muslim converts to Christianity, they face the problem of having that conversion recognized on their national ID card. So, uh, Baha'is were afforded the opportunity to have a dash on the national ID card rather than uh, uh, Baha'i affiliation because Baha'ism, of course, is not even recognized as an official religion. So, thank you for pointing that out. Um, these are very small religious minorities in Egypt, but um, some of the ones that are facing tremendous, tremendous difficulties, and we stand in solidarity for all religious minorities today. I just wanted to add really quickly that um, the Ahmadi community also has a system where they have to uh, disclaim their identity on the, to, to even get a passport in Pakistan and many other cards as well, national ID cards, so it's a similar problem. I, I also wanted to say that, um, you know, I, I just wanted to, to, to make sure I point out that the Quran says, La ikraha that there is no compulsion in religion. That is the holy book of Islam. That verse is what we believe as Ahmadis. So we do believe that Islam at its core can stand for uh, freedom of conscience and does stand for freedom of conscience. And we hope, in spite of all that we've endured um, by extremists uh, uh, within the faith, that, uh, that others and the moderate can rise and make sure that prevailing view uh, ultimately prevails for women's health. Um, again, thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, we do have the room for a little bit longer, so if you guys want to stay and chat, um, certainly feel free to do so. And again, anybody who would like any more information about HR or for feel free to talk to you.